hello, David Harper, Bionic Turtle, with a brief review of the Merton model for probability of default for FRM candidates. I continue to follow Michael Ong and credit risk models. Yesterday, we looked at this key formula for credit risk, where we saw that the expected loss of a credit or loan portfolio is equal to the product of three components. Adjusted exposure, we looked at that yesterday, loss given default, and expected default frequency, which for our purposes is the same as the probability of default, or PD. So let's look at that now. First, just to take one step back briefly, let me just remind that we have two broad approaches to the estimation of the probability of default. A reduced form, which considers default as an exogenous process, and we're not looking at that here. Instead, we're looking at the structural approach to calculating the probability of default. That treats default as an endogenous process, meaning that we explain the default as a function of the firm's fundamentals, specifically its balance sheet. And so by far the most popular approach here is the Merton model that we're looking at. And probably the most popular commercial application is Moody's KMV, which is based in large part on the Merton model, but does have some nuanced differences in the application. So similar, definitely the same concept, but different in application. In order to compute the probability default, first I'll show you graphically, and then we'll look at an Excel example. We need some assumptions, and here I'm going to follow Michael Long's example and assume the firm's assets are worth $1,000. So this is firm assets, not equity, not debt, but at equity plus debt, all of the firm's assets at 1000 We also need an assumption about the default point or default threshold. This is the point at which... If the firm's assets drop below this, we predict a default. And so a good rule here, a common rule here, would be all of the short-term liabilities plus one-half the long-term liabilities. Now, the structural model is really very simple in its idea, and that is that we predict the firm will default if the firm's assets, that's debt plus equity, drop below the default point. But this is today the complexity comes up because we're trying to predict into the future. So at the end of the period, let's assume one period, and we'd like to predict the probability of default at the end of this one year period. Already today, we can say that there's a 51% difference between the assets and the default point. In other words, natural log of 1,000 divided by 600 is 51%. This is a continuously compounded growth rate, really. 600 growing continuously at 51% gets you 1,000. And what we really mean is if 1,000 drops by 51% on a continuous basis, we would be at the default point. But that's today. So we need to know two other things. We need the volatility of the firm's assets. That's sigma, it's the standard deviation of the firm's assets. I'll assume 25%. Again, it's volatility of the assets, not of equity or debt. We also need an expected return of these firm's assets. We'll assume 20%. So this is really a growth on the firm's assets. And so now we can look to the end of the period. If these firm assets grow by 20%, then on a continuous basis, we expect the firm's assets to be here at 1,184. And we also know that this is the dispersion. And so we can apply that same structural idea. Here's the average or expected value of the firm's assets. Here's the dispersion. We simply ask, what's the probability we could end up here in this tail, way down here? It's not likely, but there is some probability if this is a random variable. That probability under the structural approach becomes our probability of default or expected default frequency. Now, in the future, if the average or expected value of the firm is 1184, our default point is still 600, that means we expect a 68% difference here on a continuous basis between the expected value of the firm and here the default. That 68% by itself doesn't really mean much to us. We need to standardize it by dividing it by the dispersion here, the 25%. And when we do that, we've now really converted this into standard normal units. 
And what we found is that based on these assumptions, this expected value of the firm's assets is 2.72 standard deviations away from this point here in the tail, which represents our default. And now it's just statistics. If this is a normal distribution, the cumulative distribution function tells us the probability that we could end up here in this tail 2.72 standard deviations away from the mean. And so now we can see here is the formula signified by D2 or denoted by D2. This is the formula used in the Merton model. And this formula implements exactly what we just walked through. Here's the natural log of the firm value divided by default point. That gives us this 51% that is already implicit on day zero. That's the implicit cushion here, plus what any kind of extra cushion we're going to get out of the positive growth rate in the firm's assets. And then we're going to divide by the volatility or standard deviation in order to convert this into standard normal units. That's going to give us D2, which is called the distance to default. And then we only need to apply the inverse normal standard cumulative distribution in order to calculate our probability of default. So now I'll show you the spreadsheet example, but first let me note, in none of this did we really use option pricing theory. Option pricing theory in the Merton model is used at the very start to get the value of the firm's assets and the volatility of the firm's assets. After we use option pricing theory to get those, this was all mechanical and is really not option pricing theory. So now let's look at the Excel spreadsheet. So here we are at the top with the same assumptions that we just looked at. At the bottom here I have the formula and then I'm just going to calculate this in the spreadsheet to show you the formula. So first I'll just do the numerator here. That's going to be the natural log of the firm's value today of 1000 divided by the default point of 600. Notice if I just stop there, I'm going to get the 51% that represents the cushion that's in the uh, firm's structure on day zero. But now I'm going to give credit for the expected growth in the assets. So I'm going to add the expected return of 20%. And then I'm going to subtract, I'm going to depress that by the volatility squared, which is the variance divided by two. So what I've really done there is calculated the expected return on a geometric basis. That's where volatility erodes the returns. And I could multiply that by T, the time, which is one year and won't really change the equation in the numerator. And that gets me the 0.68 or 68%. So that's the cushion that we expect the difference between the firm's value and the f expected value in the future and the default point. And then the denominator is going to be the volatility multiplied by the number of periods. So that's going to be 25%. And then I'm going to divide that numerator by the denominator in order really to convert the 68% to standard normal units. And that tells me that D2 or really my distance to default is 2.72 standard deviations. Now if that distribution is normal then I can use the standard normal cumulative distribution function norm s dist to tell me if I put a negative in front of it to tell me the probability that I will end up in that tail and that's 0.33 percent or about a third of one percent is my probability of default or my expected default frequency as predicted by the Merton model. So I hope this was helpful. This is David Harper, The Bionic Turtle. Thanks for your time.